Welcome everyone. Uh, you are in the right place for the uh, online uh, lecture with um, Jody Skipper. Uh, we are going to give it a few minutes, just let people log on, um, but we'll get started by at around uh, 6.05 Central Time. Welcome. Uh, you are in the right place for the Jody Skipper lecture this evening. We're going to give it a few minutes as people join the Zoom and get started by around 6.05. Welcome everyone. Uh, you are in the correct place for the Jody Skipper lecture this evening. We're going to give it just another couple of minutes uh, for people to join the Zoom, uh, get the technology sorted out, um, but we'll get started at around 6.05. 
All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, good evening. My name is Dr. Amy Catherine Medvick, and I am the Director of Educational Programming here at Herman Grimmett and Gallier Historic Houses. For those who are new, Herman Grimmett and Gallier Historic Houses, managed by the Women's Exchange, preserves two 19th century New Orleans homes and, through their architecture, collections, and history, inspires discourse about our collective past and its relevance to our present and future. We invite you to come visit us the next time you are in the French Quarter. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Jody Skipper is an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Southern Studies at the University of Mississippi. Since 2012, she has worked as a scholar in collaboration with Behind the Big House, a Mississippi slave dwelling interpretation program, which expanded to the state of Arkansas. After receiving one of eight Whitting Foundation Public Humanities Fellowships in 2017, she created BehindTheBigHouse.org, a website designed to help make the program model more accessible to individuals and institutions thinking through how they might incorporate slavery into historic site narratives. She co-edited with Michelle Coffey, Navigating South's Transdisciplinary Explorations of a U.S. Region in 2017 and an autoethnography behind the big house, Reconciling Slavery, Race, and Heritage in the U.S. South in 2022. Tonight's presentation outlines Skipper's work as a scholar in, in collaboration with Behind the Big House, um, which is a program that began in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Uh, the program is a collaborative effort between groups working to retool the city's narrative from one which largely interpreted the lives of slave owning families into one that more comprehensively incorporated the lives of enslaved people. This talk will explore Skipper's attempts to form equitable partnerships with members of the Holly Springs community through the concept of vulnerability. More specifically, the processes of earning trust through continuous exposure to collaborators. Um, so we will have a Q&A at the end of the lecture, so please hold your questions uh, until that point and use the Q&A tab that you'll see at the bottom of your screen um, to submit those questions instead of using the chat. Um, and now let's hand things over to Dr. Skipper. Thanks so much for the introduction, Amy, and thanks to the Herman Grimma Gallier Historic Houses for having me as a guest. Um, my face is a little bit blurrier than normal. I just realized that I have a scratched camera lens, so, so please bear with me here. But I will be sharing a presentation. As um, Amy said, I'll be talking about my collaboration with the Behind the Big House program in Holly Springs, Mississippi, so uh, tonight, what I'll be doing is condensing about 12 years of experience and then talking about how I've been more recently trying to uh, theorize or think through that, that work. And, and I really look forward to any feedback that you might have. So I'll begin by sharing my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, I hope that you can all see that. If not, then certainly please let me know. So as I have here, and as you've seen in the advertisement, I'm talking about this one particular program, which is about slavery and memory or remembering the lives and experiences of enslaved people in one particular place. But it's also about the concept of vulnerability that I've been thinking a lot about um, more recently, especially with a lot of the language that we've had to kind of think about particular types of work and specifically around representations of African-American history more recently and how that might relate. So I'll get to that in the latter part of the presentation, but it is coming. Right now, I'm going to start with giving those of you who aren't familiar with the program some context. So I am, I consider myself a scholar in collaboration. Uh, that means that I work closely with local communities, with specific people in those local communities to do a particular kind of work. In this case, that particular kind of work is representing slavery, as I said before. 
Uh, it's collaborative in the sense that I consider the work that I do supportive. Uh, I am on the faculty at the University of Mississippi in anthropology and Southern studies. Uh, to a certain extent, I consider the work that I do part of a broader research interest. At the same time, my goal is to help folks who are thinking about how to broaden African-American heritage on the Mississippi landscape do that. And this is one of the ways in which I've been able to do that. Uh, this is also in some ways a unique project in the sense that it's looking at a particular type of urban slavery. Um, I'm guessing that many of you who are watching are very familiar with that context in places like New Orleans, uh, where you have relatively more wealth. And you see that that type of representation of urban slavery in places like New Orleans, places like Richmond, places like Charleston. Uh, what we're talking about here is either small city or town slavery, which tends to look, look quite a bit different. And I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, for those of you who might not be as, as familiar um, with uh, North Mississippi, uh, because the southern part of the state is certainly uh, uh, closer to New Orleans, there might be more familiarity there. But I do understand that we might have um, a much broader uh, audience, national, even international. So I do want to make sure that I, I help to orient folks. So we're talking about um, a state in the southeast U.S., uh, we're talking about a county called March, Marshall County, which is in the Mississippi Hill Country in North Mississippi, or the North Mississippi Hill Country is what it's referred to. And uh, we are in uh, talking about a city called Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is, um, if, if you're thinking about proximity to Jackson, it's, it's maybe about three hours or so, I'm thinking but it much closer to Memphis. So it's considered part of the Mid-South region, maybe about 45 a minute or drive so from Holly Springs to Memphis. So we're talking about um, Mississippi slavery, but we're not talking about the slavery, for example, that we see in the context in cities like uh, Natchez, where we have this colonial slavery that later shifts into antebellum slavery. We're talking about slavery that began during the antebellum period. So what you have is a lot of folks coming from the East Coast um, to take advantage of new Chickasaw lands after Chickasaw removal in the 1830s, in particular parts of the South, removal more specifically to the Oklahoma Territory. So a lot of folks who end up moving to Holly Springs uh, some of them bring their enslaved people with them. Some of them, again, come to take advantage of this new available land and also um, thinking about ways to access wealth outside of ways that they might have been able to do on the, the East Coast or Mid-Atlantic Coast, for example. So Holly Springs, the city, is officially founded in the year 1836, and then by the 1850s, it's one of the wealthiest counties. It's in one of the wealthiest counties in the state of Mississippi. So uh, enslavement here happens within a relatively short period of time after Chickasaw removal, and people get rich pretty quickly here. When you're thinking about the context of urban slavery with a site uh, like Holly Springs, what we have is a particular city that's a support system as I have here for rural farms and plantations. So there are folks who own these big estate properties in the city. Some of them also have plantations out in the county, but they essentially run those plantations from the city of Holly Springs. So the city of Holly Springs is where you'll have um, your main schools, even universities at that time. Uh, you eventually have the um, a major railroad system coming into the city, which also uh, helps in terms of wealth building, uh, major churches and access to a lot of just um, standard goods that folks would need. It also becomes the home base to a certain extent for exporting agricultural goods from these rural farms and plantations to other parts of the country. So it's a very strategic uh, 
centralized, important location. By the mid 19th century, it um, leads the state in the production of cotton. And when we're talking about this broader county population, you have about 30,000 residents. By the mid 19th century, half of those folks are enslaved. Again, um, a lot of wealth building in a relatively short period of time. So if, if you there's one uh, antebellum homeowner, for example, uh, her name was Mary Malvina Burton. In 1842, she owns um, eight people. By 1860, she owns 87. So you get a sense of, of how she's able to wealth build in, in a relatively small period of time. Um, Another interesting thing I think about this type of urban slavery is that it is the most representative form of non-plantation slavery, but it's the least interpreted and also the least understood. We're either familiar with these rural plantations, um, those who that often show up in, in pop culture narratives, sort of that gone with the wind aesthetic. And then we have those again, like places in New Orleans and Charleston, which have uh, really gained a lot of success in terms of its tourism industry and also thinking about uh, film industries as well around this particular colonial and then antebellum slave society. So people tend to be familiar to a certain extent with what those look like, certainly most familiar with, or at least think they're most familiar with the um, the rural plantations, but what we see in Holly Springs is it's less familiar. So I often f uh, refer to uh, these type of sites that we see on these large estates. And when I say large, I mean tend to mean in between one and three acres or so of property um, as hidden in plain sight. And, and I'll show you a, an example of that. One here is the Magnolias. It's a property in Holly Springs. It's one of the most uh, renovated properties that we, we do have in the city. It's um, also uh, participated in the Behind the Big House program uh, at times. That happens when you have very uh, generous stakeholders or private own, own, homeowners who, um, who are, are really uh, conscious about the need to make these types of stories accessible and, and uh, put their homes on display as a result of that. But what you could see here is, is that if you're not really familiar to a certain extent with the fact that urban slavery existed in a city of Holly Springs, you might pass in front of a property like this and not know what you're looking at. So, you know, as you're facing uh, this particular side of the property, to your right is the main house. Uh, to its left uh, is an actual slave dwelling. It, it would not have looked exactly like that at the time. It would have been a dog trot style house. So it would have been open in the center, but you could see the, the two chimneys on um, each side uh, that would have actually, uh, in which would have held two separate rooms. Uh, there's not much consistency in terms of how these homes look. It just, most of it depends on the actual homeowner, uh, oftentimes where they come from. If, if they're from a place like Baltimore or Richmond, Virginia, and the houses tend to look a certain way there, sometimes they'll mimic uh, that house style, but it, it's really dependent on quite a few of things there. And, uh, then we also have uh, houses like the the one that became the central location for the Behind the Big House program, uh, the U uh, Craft House, and, and this is an image from the 1850s, and I'll give you a close-up that you could see more of that. But but the thing to really understand it is that folks who've been, who started to theorize these things pretty early, thinking about um, slave dwellings and, and the significance of those structures like uh, John uh, Flatch, for example, refer to these urban estates as still shaped by plantation ideals. So although they're not actual plantations, they're still shaped by the ideals of the plantation. They still operate with a comparable plantation hierarchy where you have enslaved people who are under these oppressive uh, regimes of their particular owners but who live within um, very close proximity to each other. So, so in that case, we might interpret it a little bit differently than we might think of on large scale plantations. 
Uh, we can also think about them as urban compounds because uh, most, most of what you need, uh, most of the labor would also happen on these particular properties. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So here's a close up of that image. If, if you look uh, really closely, you'll see um, in the center of the main house, you'll see the front door to the property. And uh, just to the right of the door, but to our left, you'll see a well-dressed Black man. Uh, because this is an image in the 1850s, this is likely an enslaved man, uh, possibly a valet who worked on the property. We know that in the years 1850, as well as 1860, there were nine people enslaved on this one property. And what you'll also see in, in the background is... Um, uh, basically the top of the slave dwelling on that property, which would have also doubled as a kitchen. Uh, not abnormal uh, for slave quarters, certainly in the antebellum period and even, even before, but the actual um the actual build of the of the structure or architecture tends to vary. So in this particular case, you have a one main floor of the slave dwelling with three separate rooms, so two separate apartments, and then an extended kitchen. There's also a loft and a cellar on this one slave dwelling property, which means that uh, all of the enslaved people likely lived in this one slave dwelling, again, which you see, which is uh, right, uh, really close to the main house, or might have slept uh, inside the main house or, or the dynamics might have shifted. Uh, most of those enslaved people would have been what we consider children, um, uh, but not necessarily would have been considered children uh, at that time. For example, uh, some of them are relatively young, but there are folks who uh, 16 years old, for example, who would have been doing very adult labor at that time. So it, it also gives us a complicated way of thinking about childhood and what that actually means uh, for an enslaved person. The uh, initial homeowner and also uh, co-developer of the Behind the Big House program, Achilles Carter, along with his wife, Jennifer Eggleston, uh, sketched an image of what, um, a, a, to some extent, if we could think about what an average day of that on that property might have looked like, he really tried to imagine here. So the image that you saw in the last side, uh, we're facing the front of house. In this case, we're facing the back and what you could see uh, within this particular uh, area in between the main house and the slave dwelling are, are people doing different uh, forms of labor. Uh, for example, um, there's uh, someone with a cast iron pot, uh, possibly doing a laundry or something else of that sort. Uh, you could see that there's someone on a wagon as well, uh, closer to the front of the yard. You could also see in the, the background near the person in the wagon, a, um, a lattice fence. And it's important to think about that. So we do know that there would have been a lattice fence uh, in between the main house and the slave dwelling designed to um, basically hide the labor that's going on within this particular space. So uh, it, we often refer to the labor of enslaved people as hidden labor. And um, we think about that figuratively in some sense, but you see a literal case of the labor being, being hidden here. This is essentially with the craft house uh, well, it look, I, I should say it looks like today I, I didn't have the most recent image because um, the new owners, uh, the Rosa Foundation, and I, I think they actually might be on here watching Sally Goddard and uh, Ron Alisar uh, repainted the house closer to the original color. So it's more of a um, salmon color color paint. But this does give you a sense of, of what it uh, looked like up, up until maybe uh, a year or so ago. And you see to the left, the slave dwelling uh, and essentially what that continues to like, it, what that uh, looks like today. And uh, that's the one that I described in terms of the one main level with three separate rooms, the loft, and then the cellar. <laughs> 
so I, I gave you an introduction to um, a little bit of historical context and then an introduction to the site. And now I'll actually talk about the program and how that came to be again for those who, who aren't familiar. So when we think about cities like Holly Springs uh, and many others around the country in the early to mid 20th century, uh, folks are really trying to think about diverse ways of making money, especially in communities uh, that are really struggling as a result of the Great Depression. Holly Springs is no different during that time. And what you get are a, a group of one, women who are part of this Holly Springs Garden Club in the 1930s. And they visit the historic Natchez pilgrimage that some of you might be familiar with. But for those who aren't, um, the pilgrimage in Natchez, I, I think the, the first pilgrimage date is in 1932, uh, was also managed by a garden club there. And the goal of those women were, it, it was actually to a certain extent more of a beautification movement, uh, having folks to come to Holly Springs and, and look at the gardens, the landscape of the gardens. And that um, er, the earlier, I think actually the first year that uh, transitioned into interest in the actual homes, visiting those homes and, uh, Subsequently, we had one of the most popular tours, not just in the state of Mississippi, but in the country. So in which you have folks from who are traveling from all over the country and then all over the world to come and look at these historic houses, some of them colonial, but these huge estates are so large that um, when you visit them, you might think that they're actual uh, plantations because of their size. And um, the women who visited the Natchez pilgrimage that year thought, well, you know, maybe Holly Springs can do something comparable. And they they pitched that idea uh, to others in the city. It um, Not everyone got on board initially, but eventually the Holly Springs pilgrimage uh, of a uh, pilgrimage tour of homes and uh, that came to include churches and, and cemeteries as well. It uh, started officially in 1938 after the centennial pilgrimage in 1936 and all but uh, for a few years uh, during World War II and also during the um, uh, the height of the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, the program has, has consistently uh, gone on. And what you see are some images from that early 1936 pilgrimage. So Holly Springs developed uh, this history of interpreting the antebellum period, but with this gap of interpreting the experiences of enslaved people. So um, over the years, I, I think even early on, there were representatives of enslaved people. So some black people who participated, but actually thinking about their experiences and how essential they were to the economy and wealth being, well, uh, wealth building in Holly Springs uh, is something that didn't happen until more recently. And that's because of Chilius Carter and Jennifer Eggleston, who I mentioned earlier, who in 2011 started to think about how to actually add those more holistic narratives to this Garden Club annual pilgrimage tour of homes and churches. Uh, they had a personal investment in the sense that they realized that the property, the Ucraft property that they bought at the time had a slave dwelling or the, these kitchen quarters on their property. So they really wanted to think about how they could contribute to making those narratives more accessible. They contacted several other homeowners in Holly Springs with comparable properties and got together and started this slave dwelling interpretation program. Uh, they initially contacted Joseph McGill Jr., who then had his slave cabin project, now slave dwelling project, and, and I'm, I'm sure that um, several of you are familiar with that. And uh, you know, asked his advice: How do we build this type of community based program? And and at the time, Joe McGill didn't really know of any that existed, so he. Um, forewarned them that they would be the first to think about how to have a local grassroots movement around slavery interpretations and became a collaborator with them 
that first year and continues to be. Initially, the program's target audience was um, those who visited the pilgrimage, uh, which means that the Behind the Big House program would happen at the same time that the pilgrimage happened. Uh, there were different iterations of that sometimes um, or earlier on, at least the first year working with the pilgrimage and then one year after that. But for the most part, it's been a, se a separate program. So um, coexisting, but without much collaboration. And uh, one thing that kind of helped, well, a major thing that helped this program survive is that um, a local woman, Linda Turner, came to the program the first year and became one of its biggest supporters and started to bring in Marshall County school children to the program. I think uh, the second year there were 400 or so school children who came in and, and has consistently done that each year that the program has been active. Um, as I mentioned before, the program is now managed by the Rosa Foundation, who, um, again, I mentioned Sally Goddard and, and Ron Alisar, who, like uh, Chilius and Jennifer and, and other stakeholders in Holly Springs, are really doing this work because of the potential significance, uh, not because there's a financial benefit in it, but because they think it's the right thing to do, because they think that these stories need to be told. So I certainly thank them for that. And then I'll talk a little bit more about um, that work and how that relates to the concept of vulnerability that I'm thinking through now. So the program has some, some basic components that shifted um, over the years. What you, what you see here is an image of the main house, Burden Place, which is another house in Holly Springs uh, that was on tour for many years uh, when it was owned by David Person, who was also a major supporter of the program. It also consists of um, a slave dwelling adjacent to the property, which actually mimics the main house in terms of um, its brick structure. Uh, that one, to a certain extent, is more reminiscent of some of the structures that you'll see uh, in places like like Charleston, but but again, there's not much consistency across those houses. So uh, one of the goals of the program has certainly been comprehensive narratives, and then this picture here in the long sleeve blue shirt, you could see um, David Person. I think this might have been the 2014 program. Uh, giving an introduction to interpretations at Burden Place uh, to, I think that was uh, actually busload of pilgrimage visitors who came through that year. And one of the interesting thing about the programs, of course, is that because they were happening at the same time, uh, but not actually working collaboratively, is that often folks would... Um, mistake the Behind the Big House program for the more standard pilgrimage and not realize that it was, um, that the interpretations were solely based on and rooted in interpretations or representations of slavery. And I, I consider these narratives comprehensive because uh, folks like David did not segregate uh, the narrative in the main house from the narrative in the slave dwelling. Uh, the entire property was interpreted through slavery, which, which could be really shocking initially to folks who are accustomed to standard architectural and furnishing descriptions of houses. So when you see this image to your right, for example, uh, that is um, a segregated staircase that the enslaved people would have used inside of that main house. Uh, so David, for example, spent quite a bit of time highlighting that segregated access and what that meant. Local youth education became um, a major priority, although it was a goal early on. The program didn't have much success with that until Linda Turner got involved with the local schools. So they're the main target group, although the program is free and open to members of the public. So we try to advertise as widely as possible and intend to get folks from across the Mid-South who come in that case. We also think about how to make slavery accessible through demonstrations, a, a major uh, partner and uh, docent interpreter, collaborator is uh, Afro-culinary historian, 
Michael Twitty, who came into the program, I can't remember if it's the second or third year, but pretty early on and has been a consistent participant. Um, here you could see Michael in the center of a group of Marshall County students. Um, the students are, are mesmerized by his vocality, by his ability to be entertaining and real and serious about slavery at the same time, which is very significant, but also thinking about it thematically through something like food ways, which is very accessible uh, to most people. We also have um, folks like Tammy Gibson, who uh, works as a laundress interpreter, and then also Wayne Jones and Dale DeBerry, who do brick making demonstrations. So those, to a certain extent, are, are more standard practices that you would see in slavery interpretations in, in other places. But I just feel like I should uh, highlight that as a very integral program component. Uh, my partnership with the program has has varied. I was initially introduced to the program through Joe McGill Jr., who I, I met when I had a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of South Carolina. That's where he's from. Um, I also brought in my heritage tourism course students and also African diaspora students pretty early on who also serve as interpreters for the program and, and have pretty much consistently done that. Uh, after, I think the second year, my colleague, uh, Carolyn Frywald, who's a bioarchaeologist, bio got involved with the program. And then um, we started doing archaeology excavations under her leadership. So introducing a broader anthropology students into that. And um, if I, I think that I've estimated that within the past uh 10 years or so, we probably had about 200 University of Mississippi students participate uh, in that program. Even uh, early on, we did have Russ College students participate uh, as well. For those who, who might not be as familiar with Russ College, it's, it's a small HBCU, but certainly very significant historically Black college that's located in Holly Springs. I also got involved uh, through David Person and um, uh, Alicia Williams McLeod, who was then chair of humanities at Russ College and our biggest supporter in terms of helping with student involvement. Uh, met up the first year of Behind the Big House and started to think about how to keep the conversations around slavery going. Um, and Holly Springs isn't unique in the sense in, in that it's a very segregated community, racially segregated community in many ways. And um, uh, Alicia and David witnessed that behind the big house moment as one of the most integrated ones in the city and wanted to think about how to sustain that. So they started a racial reconciliation group uh, called Gracing the Table, which is modeled after coming to the table that's um, based uh, through Eastern Mennonite University that has done a lot of significant work around um, a bridge building between descendants of uh, enslaved people and, and, and enslavers. So a lot of the work has been comparable with these main goals, uncovering history, working toward healing, making connections, and then also taking action. So I um, started to be involved with that program, which uh, has done an ancestor libation ceremony uh, each year with the help of its members. I mentioned Wayne Jones before. Um, uh, Raketi Jones has also been very essential uh, to honoring ancestors uh, each year, uh, knowing that we must call on them, call them in, and also ask their permission for the kind of work that they do. So it's very integral to not only interpret slavery, but make these explicit connections to what it means to try to heal our communities in the present. And, and that's been the work of Gracing the Table. I think that one of Gracing the Table's biggest success stories has certainly been um, the work of descendants of the uh, Burdens who were enslaved by Mary Burden that I mentioned um, earlier, who uh, had owned 87 people by 1860. One of her, one of her descendants, uh, Deborah Davis, uh, made contact with David Person relatively early in the program years, and and started this uh, very invaluable relationship, in in which she's dedicated 
a lot of time and energy to come and help us with interpretations, but also helping to organize family reunions in which they come back to their ancestral home property. And, and um, this is something that I've, I've thought through quite a bit. Uh, what does it mean for uh, Black folks to actually think about former sites of slavery as ancestral homes is a very complicated process, but one that I've I've been thinking through for a while. And um, Deborah Davis's connection has certainly been essential to helping me think through that. So I've, I've as a scholar in collaboration, I, I try to um, make some interventions to try to think about how my work could be more explicitly reciprocal. And Chilius and Jennifer for years said that they wanted the Behind the Big House program to be a replicable model. So I really tried to think about ways to do that. And um, in 2018, developed a Behind the Big House website, um, which helps folks who have little to no uh, human or economic resources to do this kind of work. And, and it essentially gives them some steps to help with that. More recently, in, in 2022, I published an autoethnography behind the Big House Reconciling Slavery, Race, and Heritage in the U.S. South um, with the University of Iowa Press, so that um, to give folks a, a behind-the-scenes look at what it means to do this kind of work, I think it, it, what, what we saw especially with uh, the level of race awareness that we've had uh, nationally in the past few years are uh, a lot of critiques about what it means to represent slavery. And, and sometimes those critiques aren't very nuanced or very understanding of the labor involved um, and with little to no reward outside of, as I said before, knowing that it's uh, the right thing to do and how difficult that can be in terms of labor, in terms of um, emotional health for the people who do it. So I really wanted to write a book that leaned into that. And at the time, what I did was um, I interviewed my collaborators, uh, the Behind the Big House collaborators, as well as Gracing the Table, to think about what about our lives led us to do this kind of work? I, I wanted to pe people to understand the type or types to a certain extent. And, and people have diverse experiences, yet there's still something I think that essentially leads people uh, to come to do, do the work of representing slavery and doing that work collaboratively. So my autoethnography, as I said before, has really leaned into that. And I, um, I spent a significant amount of time through my chapter on gracing the table, again, thinking about what it takes to do this kind of work, but I wasn't quite sure how to name that. And I, I do think that naming is very important. It, it could have a lot to do with um, how I'm trained to think about things as a social scientist. But I had a feeling, I, I was feeling a particular type of way, even as I, I wrote the book, but really didn't have the language to describe that experience in the way that I would have liked to. So I, I started to really think about the most, I think, gut level feeling that I've had doing this kind of work. And that feeling is a feeling of vulnerability, again, which is what I'm thinking through now. Um, what does it mean to be vulnerable? I think that's an essential component uh, required to do this kind of work with some success, at least. And, and I'll get into that a bit more. It also takes some willing participants, which is something that Joe McGill Jr. stresses quite a bit. Um, you need folks who are going to show up and consistently show up. And again, that's easier said than done because uh, not many folks have the privilege of time or um, emotional capacity and a lot of other things required to do this. So it's, that's something that I certainly did stress stress in my book. And, and here's an image of uh, Joe McGill to our right, and then um, Wayne Jones and, and Rick Hetty Jones to his right in the image. 
I think that a lot of this personal vulnerability um, has to come uh, through this process of trust building, um, opening yourself up to forming relationships with other people, and also having this shared struggle and continuous exposure. So my collaborators and I have over a 12 year period shared in the struggle and also in the joy of doing this kind of work. It, it has those moments, but there's quite a bit of struggle. And um, the continuous exposure, I think, bonds people in, in particular ways. But you really have to be vulnerable in order to do that. And, you know, I, one thing that I also talk about in the book is how that vulnerability was a process for me. Again, not naming that, but trying at the time at least to show that that um, I grew up in a society in which I was socialized to not trust people who are white for a variety of reasons. Um, I think my parents grew up in the 1940s and 1950s and um, um, saw that as a protective mechanism. And I was socialized with a comparable protective mechanism. So um, what I thought, at least through that socialization, was that I would somehow be less vulnerable to racial discrimination and racism by protecting myself and segregating myself. And I, I, I don't think that that's a unique experience, although of course not the experiences um, of all black, black folks who live in the US or more specifically in the US South. But I really, I had to, I had to become vulnerable. I, I had to access that vulnerability. I had to be willing to trust people enough uh, to know that this work might hurt me, but that there's a greater good in that that hurt or that potential pain. And I think that vulnerability really ties into that, especially when we think about its root, its root word or coming from the um the Latin noun um vulnus, which means wound. Um, originally meaning capable of, of being physically wounded or having the power to wound. Again, if you just kind of do a um, rudimentary dictionary search, you'll see that, that the latter term is now obsolete, but um, more in a more contemporary sense, you could sometimes we'll hear this in terms of thinking about um, defenselessness against a non-physical attack. And, and if we think about Cybersecurity. I, I had to do um, cybersecurity training for for my um, workplace, and vulnerability is an essential term there that you don't want to be vulnerable to cyber attacks. But this idea of allow, allowing oneself to be wounded is is really what I'm trying to think through. So when I connected to that framing, I started to look at folks who've been thinking about this. Um, and the past few years and, and even prior to that. And, and one thing that the past few years um, has done is opened up uh, a common language through which we could talk about race work. And uh, so Ibram Kendi's work and, and um, the work of Robin D'Angelo and others, regardless of particular criticisms are a super value in the fact that they gave us a common language in which to speak speak these things out. And vulnerability, I think, is one of those things that might have been um, a bit more overlooked in this conversation, but certainly still still very um, integral, uh, an integral part of that conversation, especially to those who were, who were leading in that way. And, and Brene Brown is one of them, um, a social work professor at the University of Houston who uh, began a te TED talk describing excruciating vulnerability and, and saying that in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be to be seen. And you know, for those who have read, for example, um, Robin D'Angelo's work, a lot of that was framed around this notion of white fragility. And um, you know, there there are other folks who've kind of thought about what that means in terms of race work. Some have been a bit more critical of that term fragility, leaning more into vulnerability uh, in this particular particular case. And I do th think that there's some value in that again, but I, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I, I like the idea of thinking through the, th drinking through the terms and the type of work that they, they do. But 
I think that, you know, vulnerability for Black folks is often socialized and, and then we create these protective mechanisms to not be as vulnerable. I think for people who are racialized as white, often to do this race work, they really have to intentionally lean into that vulnerability or something in their life experience has to minoritize them in a way that they become vulnerable to understand. And, and I think that you know, even with these, um, you know, more recent attacks on uh, slavery education, critical race theory, and all of these other things that it's, it's amazing how much has happened in a relatively short number of years, we still have to hold on to the ability to speak these things and use that language and not get lost in, in all of what's happened in the past uh, couple of years. We I, I think that a lot of folks really um, got on the bandwagon of doing this type of, of race work when it was popular or convenient, but we start to, to see a little bit less of that. But for those of us who do this historic president work, racial work and who are doing this work even before popular discussions about it, I think that we really have to think about how we move through that type of work. And, and again, I think that that naming is really helpful. I uh, really, you know, when, as I was thinking through this, I was looking through some old photographs. Um, you know, David Person, one of our major partners, uh, passed, passed away. And um, I was looking through photographs of him giving tours for a talk that that I, I gave in 2022. And again, he's he's to our right here in the long sleeve blue shirt. And, you know, when I, I look at this image, I really see a variety of responses. And I took this, this photo. I didn't really have an... I didn't really have a particular motive or intent outside of documenting at the time. But when I looked through these photos again, I really saw several of these people tend to struggle. And I'm, I'm really interested in, in what folks might think about um, what they see in that. So please feel free to share that in the chat if you'd like. And we could also discuss that a bit later. But folks who have shifted their their bodies, um, some of them look away from David. And what you're witnessing is the moment that these folks who expect to hear um, this sort of congratulatory, uh, celebratory narrative of uh, antebellum life, explicitly stating that he's going to tell them a story about slavery. And vulnerability, I think is essentially what folks would need in order to be able to move to a lot of those those spaces um, with with some sense of, of safety and again something we can talk about a bit more. And I mentioned a lot of the work that was happening around twenty twenty, and um, I went through for for reminders of that and and some of these things stuck out to me. One is. Um, this conversation that Ibram Kendi had with uh, Brene Brown, again, who had done quite a bit of work on vulnerability for years, e even before we started to have a lot of these public discussions, but saying that when we find ourselves able to step into a role of genuine vulnerability in this moment, again, this is the summer of 22 that they're talking about here, we can see more clearly where racism and injustice stem from. Holding this awareness, we can begin to walk the long path of change with presence, compassion, and courage. And they also say that the heartbeat of anti-racism is confession, is admission, is acknowledgement, is the willingness to be vulnerable. And what I hope that my work does is really help the doers, the historic preservationists behind this work really think about what that vulnerability means to and for them. And I'll stop there, thank you. Wonderful, I'm just going to uh, switch over our screens here. Um, thank you so much, Jody. what a fantastic talk and a powerful message.
Um, we're going to open it up to the Q&A. So if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little button that says Q&A. Um, you can put your questions up there. I will field them and pass them on to Jody. Um, and I guess to start, since we don't have any questions up yet, um, I have a couple of my own, so I'll put one of those forward while people are thinking about their questions. Um, so my first question came about when you mentioned um, sort of architectural elements meant to hide the labor of slavery, which makes tons of sense. Um, but it got me thinking because at our own property, in our own interpretation of enslavement and architecture, we actually talk more about surveillance and the ways architecture was used to be able to uh, facilitate um, the enslaver watching over the enslaved. So I'm curious if you could comment on, from your experience of a lot of different sites, the tensions between that like architecture of hiding and that architecture of surveillance and what comes out of that. Yeah, that's a great question, Amy. And, and certainly surveillance is a key, um, I think, way of thinking through the work that we do as as well, even though we're talking about a relatively small piece of property and then a main house again with, with a slave dwelling adjacent to it in these cases. Uh, the way that the house, these houses are structured means that from the second floor, you could see essentially what's going on uh, in the yard. So you could literally witness that labor. Uh, so um, surveillance is really integral also in the in terms of how it so surveillance and access i think are inextricably linked here and that access and hidden labor are also linked so when we're talking about for example the slave dwelling at the craft property the front door of the property is not the door facing the main street. The front door is the door facing the main house. And that access to the main house through that architectural layout clearly shows the priority for that property. That enslaved people move from the main, from their slave dwelling directly into the main house. The segregated corridors are segregated such that the enslaved people don't even have access to each other in the separate rooms, but each have access to the main house. From those doors of the main house into the main property, there's a segregated stair access so that only one of them might be allowed to actually go into the dining room. The rest would not have access uh, that way. So. There's hidden access certainly there and the architecture is strategically uh, designed that way. But although for the enslaved people, the front access is to the main house, what folks who are passing by will see without a lattice fence is that hidden labor, right? So you what you do is make that inaccessible to the rest of folks, right? So enslaved people are essentially only accessible to the white owners of, of the property. And I, I think often about what it means to be socialized that way for a lifetime, right? And there are historians who think about those types of things and um, also archaeologists, which I'm trained as as well when they think about um, think about features in, in layouts. But it's I think it's a really interesting question. And when you look at each of these sites, there's something I think that resonates about that, but it looks different at each each site, certainly. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, I mean it was it was open ended. I was just curious how you saw those two things play out in in different spaces because they, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about like the the architecture of butler's pantries and just sort of that that there's this like intermediate space where like at, at one of our historic properties, you know, it's this whole separate room that has a door that leads to the dining room and a door that leads to the hall down to the kitchen so that um, enslaved people who are 
in the midst of preparing the food can bring the food into this intermediary room and then other enslaved people who are going to be dressed up to serve the food are serving it from that space just to give everyone a, an idea of what what that that room's purpose is but at, at Gallier House in particular there's those two doors and then there's also just a door that goes from the dining room to the hall so there's like all these different passageways that are for different people in different directions and so clearly about not about practicality, not about, you know, ease of building it. it. It's it's really about creating a hierarchy and controlling the ways that people can and can't move through the space yeah. and controlling the giving giving the um, enslavers the option of being able to see the labor or being able to close it off and not see it when it suited them. So it was just, I, you know, something that I kind of thought about in a very different kind of space and was curious, you know, what what your experience of it was. We've got a few questions that have come up on the chat now, so I'm going to pass some of these on to you. Um, one of our guests says, thank you, Jody. It seems there are a few layers of vulnerability for Black academics who may also be descendants of the enslaved. Have you had a palpable difference in these layers of vulnerability? That's a good question. Um, I probably have. I'm not quite sure what I've named them at that moment. I, I have to say that maybe, I, I think that in, especially when I first started doing this kind of work as a, a graduate student, I guess that was the late 1990s or so. What I noticed was that whenever, so for example, I, I was doing a project as a grad student working with the National Park Service. And it was um, a former rural plantation. And we were looking at the part of that plantation in which enslaved people lived and what you had with the remaining chimneys on that property. I was the only black person on the archeology span crew. And what I noticed is that when the uh, newspaper folks would come to do uh, articles about the project, I would get photographed. And I would get photographed strategically in between the chimneys in ways that other people didn't. And although I had been socialized to think about enslaved people as my ancestors in general, I didn't necessarily feel comfortable with being put into the box, right? So I think that I probably developed some mechanisms over time um, that reflect that early response in ways that maybe I haven't thought about this, these different layers of vulnerability. But I'll certainly say that as an academic, and, and this is something that I talked about in my book as well, that I've had to be vulnerable with my collaborators in Holly Springs. I've also had to be vulnerable with and give a lot of grace to the people who visit our sites who are coming from all kinds of backgrounds and a variety of different levels of understanding. I've also had to, there's also been a lot of vulnerability in being an academic during this kind of work when it's not as valued because it can't be measured in the ways that academic um, tenure and promotion frames are, um, academic practice more broadly frames success, significant work. So um, the rhetoric is that it's significant, but the value system doesn't exist. So I'm not quite sure that I have different ways of naming those things yet, but that at, at best at this point, I could, those are the different levels that I could, could think of. Yeah. Um, another question that kind of bounces off some of the things you were just saying. Um, could you comment more on the idea that you mentioned of former sites of slavery as ancestral spaces and what you're thinking through with that? Yeah, certainly. I think, you know, one thing that I really started to think about is, is what it really takes for folks like Deborah Davis and some of her other family members to feel that a former site of slavery is accessible enough to them to want to actually tour it and learn from it. And, you know, early on when I started doing this work in Holly Springs, um, sometimes I would see, you know, Black 
local folks walking on the street and I would say, hey, we've got this slavery interpretation program. Are you interested in visiting? And the default response was, why would I want to do that? And it's a good question. Why would anyone really want to lean into that? And I think that, you know, oftentimes I've, I've worked on projects where I think the project managers think that if they develop interpretations of African-American history, then Black folks will just come. But this is not an if you build it, they will come model. This is not how this works. I've come as close to if you make it accessible and if you know that they're valued in this spaces, then you might get some of them to come and then come again. And I think that so much of this in our case, because these are privately owned places, is dependent on the owners. And we've had such gracious and knowledgeable owners, all of them white, who have really done the work of making these properties accessible to Black folks. I, my students, um, you know, this is really hard work for them. They've had to make themselves vulnerable in a relatively short period of time, a part of a semester to do this work. There were things that I didn't expect that would happen to them. So one homeowner had um, cotton on display and some of my students were triggered by the display of cotton. Um, you know, there are things that maybe I should have predicted, but just didn't, didn't know. And I think that that certainly had to be balanced by people they saw racialized as white who really saw their stories as valuable. And I think that translates to thinking of them as valuable. And that's not something that Black folks tend to get from white people very often. So I think that our program has largely been dependent on those immediate, um, those immediate intimate connections for people. I've, I've heard people who've toured the program as well who've said that if the homeowners weren't as kind, as gracious as they were, that they might have fallen apart on those tours um, in, emotionally, right? So that type of feedback, I think, really helps us to understand how significant that is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have another question here. Um, what do you say to those who say that we should move on beyond slavery and trauma what would you say to those who say that whites have a fascination with black trauma and that the false ideas of white supremacy prevent them from seeing the vulnerability of black? So kind of con uh, um, contrasting the idea of vulnerability versus sort of trauma. I'll start that one, Amy, but I might have to have you repeat the latter part after, <laughs> after we start yeah. this. So, um, you know, the moving on is, you know, this is something that I get in the classroom a lot. And the privilege of the classroom is that what I get to show students is that Black folks in, I think, I'm, I'm not going to generalize, but many Black folks don't move on because the country hasn't moved on. That hasn't happened. So what I can show them is the Civil War, to Reconstruction, to Jim Crow. And then, you know, essentially say to them that my generation, my parents' generation is the first that actually had full citizenship in this country. I'm only one step away from that and getting them to think about that. We don't necessarily have that privilege of that time in those spaces, but I do think that it's still important to kind of show that long history when we can so that folks tend, tend to understand. Um, I, I also think that it's important to equate moving on with um, ignoring and then asking people the hard questions. Why? Why are you not interested in talking about this? I, I think that, you know, even with the web, for example, it becomes a lot easier for people to hide behind these assertions without being asked tough questions. It takes a particular skill set to do it, but I think that it's something that we really have to work on, especially when we work in these spaces to do that. I often get folks who are white and elder who might say, I don't mind your history being told as long as mine is told as well then I ask them to separate those things, right? 
So it's not, um, you know, that's part of the work of the conference. Oh, that's interesting. I'm, I'm certainly interested in understanding yours. Can you tell me how they're separate? I think it's important to make people do that kind of work on the spot, on site, if and when you can. You might have to repeat the second part of that. Yeah, the second part is, um, what would you say to those who say that whites have a fascination with black trauma and that the false ideas of white supremacy prevent them from seeing the vulnerability of black people? Yeah, I, you know, there's, I, I agree that that's the case. I think that the work of folks like Brian Stevenson have shown how legally black trauma has been normalized. Um, when we think about, um, expressing his work related to the prison industrial complex and then kind of how that relates to uh, lynching crimes in the U.S. or what were actually not considered criminal behavior often um, as problematic in those cases. But that we are normalized, I, th I think, to kind of, um, that Black trauma is normalized. I, I'm not quite sure... Um, you know, the, the shift really is getting people to see the vulnerability. And I'm, I'm not quite sure that I have a good answer for this because this has been hard for me as well. Seeing Black people as vulnerable means seeing them as human. And the problem is that many white folks don't see Black people as human. Part of that um, part of normalizing that trauma also means normalizing people as a different and then inferior. And I at least came to a point in my work where what I really had to try to do is show students literally how race is invented and happens. So that once they understand that something is made, that maybe it could be unmade. But I'm not quite sure how you do that when people continue to see that each other is essentially different. I think that's what I think the work has to be in not in people not seeing each other as essentially different. And I think that if you ask most um, people who are even informed, you know, about race, they'll say we're all the same. But if you ask them, how they can't tell you and anthropology has taught me how to articulate that but that's not you know most people don't have that language and that's been my way I'm just not quite sure how to do that out, outside of that so tell yeah. me I mean I think the the idea of vulnerability starts to get close to it because it just strikes me that like we might have a problem as a society with even understanding what human is. You know, we we put un unhuman expectations in various senses on on almost everyone, and vulnerability is is that humanizing thing where it's like, you know, you're you're real, you're not always perfect, you're not always strong, and that's that's human, and like being able to grant that to people is is hard, but that is like the foundational work of doing this work, of doing other kinds of justice work. Um, but yeah, that I, I feel like you've hit on something very crucial to that whole question with, mm -hmm. with the vulnerability piece. And it's it's great to see it spoken about in an academic context, because I feel like we don't we don't do that. Yeah. Um, great. There's a couple of other questions here. Um what are some of the stories crucial to telling in the physical structures that are not reflected in the materiality of the structures? Uh, this was a wonderful presentation, so thank you again. hope the presentation will be available elsewhere, and it will. Um, just to let everyone know, we are going to put this up. It's being recorded. We'll put it up on YouTube um, within 24 hours. So I'll pass that off to you just to repeat it. Um, some of the stories crucial to tell in the physical structures, but that aren't reflected in the materiality of the structures. Yeah. It's a great question. These are great questions. And I, I, you know, I have to say that in my experience working in Holly Springs, those stories have really come from descendants like Deborah Davis. So things that we can't see in, in archives, we can't see through census records, we can't see through the diaries of former owners, for example, or even in, you know, you 
certainly have to read through, bet read between the lines in WP air narratives and things like that. But um, I think that those stories still are important to tell because even with all of the critiques that the WPA narratives get, the state of Mississippi hid its narratives essentially up until the 1970s for a reason. And it's because a lot of the former enslaved people were articulating resistance and anger, even from their perspectives as children. I think that those stories are important to tell. I also think that the stories that I initially hinted at from descendants are important to tell. And, and one example is um, that Dev Davis gave us that one of her ancestors was actually um, bred as an enslaved person throughout uh, particular parts of, I, I think the Mid-South, if I remember correctly. And what does that mean in terms of impact on family, right? She's a genealogist. What does that mean to genealogy work? I think that, you know, folks hear these things, um, you know, maybe see them in movies, maybe read them, maybe hear about them. But I think that until they hear it from a person who connects it to their literal experience, it's still somehow unbelievable to many people. And, you know, I've, I've had this situation where, um, you know, Deb Davis, for example, might be interpreting in a slave dwelling. And when people realize that she's directly connected, and I know that this also relates to material culture because she's in it, but I still think it's an important example to share, that people really become sympathetic. And uh, one thing that I've always said is, I wish that I could bottle that sympathy and spread it because there's not a black person with enslaved ancestors in this country who doesn't have a similar story. But the sympathy isn't there in the same way. She has to literally be in that space for that to happen. I don't, I don't get that kind of sympathy. I'm black, but I'm not a descendant of that site to people, right? So what does it mean for people to really make those connections? I think that it often requires those descendants. And I know that that sites are really leaning into more of that now, but I, I think we need to have some more serious conversations about what that means. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question, um, how many comparable homes like the Hugh Craft are located within Holly Springs and are there plans to involve those homes with behind the big house project? Um, second part to the question is, is there any pushback from locals to provide the program to the community, especially as it's collaborating with this pilgrimage? Yeah, another great question. I think so. Uh, one thing that I didn't say in, in detail is that um, we've had a different number of homes on tour at different times. I think it was probably the year 2014, we had seven homes on tour. Seven was very difficult for our strictly volunteer base to manage. So then we went down to three and then one. These properties are also vulnerable, meaning that they're privately owned and privately owned means that people can sell, people can die, we can lose them for all kinds of reasons. They're also very expensive in terms of upkeep and you often have to be wealthy to be able to do that. There isn't much structural support for that. So, you know, I... So we've had more, but we weren't able to sustain it as a program because we never developed um, more of a, um, I guess I could say committed long-term base to be able to manage that, which has been a struggle for us in so many ways. I estimate that there are at least 20 of those still remaining. So there are a significant amount in this one city and um, they're at different risk levels. And, and when I say risk, I mean in terms of structural integrity, but also in terms of ownership. So again, we, we've tried to, to kind of survey. Um, we don't necessarily get full participation from lots of people. That was part of the question. I My personal experience hasn't um, been from people who've explicitly said to me, we don't want this. I think that a lot of those conversations are probably private. And I think that my white collaborators probably field 
more of those negative responses than I do. So it's there. I just haven't been hit with it, you know, explicitly or firsthand. Yeah. Um, so another couple questions. Um, have you used surveys to capture visitor reactions and what results uh, would you like to share, if any? There's some. So we are funded by the Mississippi Humanities Council and have been since the program started. So our surveys haven't been personal program surveys, but the Mississippi Humanities Council surveys. And, you know, I, I think that you know, overwhelming the feedback has been pretty positive in, in general. We need this. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for creating this kind of space. Sometimes there are more specific critiques about, um, you know, inconsistency in the storytelling or something like that. And again, most of the docent folks are my students and local volunteers. So you might get someone who's telling um, someone who's more skilled at the narrative storytelling one day and then the next day not. So that's probably been the biggest critique we've gotten. We don't have, um, there hasn't been a longer term strategy for this because to date it's been a once a year program and are either as scheduled for, for group, private groups, right? So we don't necessarily have, um, I, I think that we, we can't do a longer term store study of those evaluations because of that, but that's been my experience with the evaluations that we've actually gotten. Great. Um, and another person is wondering, they say, thank you, Dr. Skipper. Can you describe some of the benefits people experience from doing this type of work? Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, it's been life changing in so many ways in terms of um, my relationships really to I, I this a lot of my trust building with white people has either been through personal experiences in education that's outside of my, you know, particular upbringing. And then this program, because there's so little reward and I often associate this type of historic preservation work with folks who are either forced to do it or see a particular financial economic benefit or some other type of benefit that can be measured and with the folks with whom I work that just hasn't been the case so that's been life-changing in terms of how I see how I see people it's also um I, I think for other folks, they would probably say similar, similar things. I think, you know, with my collaborators, what I found is that this work is important, but it's also a big part of um, a longer life's work for them, right? So it's not that they just jumped into um, interpreting African-American heritage. They were doing something around African-American heritage, just something around historic preservation, something around community building, something around community engagement prior to doing this kind of work. So maybe um, it, it might be perceived as more life-changing if, if that wasn't maybe part of a longer narrative for them. But I you know, my feedback from visitors, at least, has really been that this has been life changing, especially for people who are local from North Mississippi, who just either had no idea that these sites still existed, but certainly didn't expect this type of representation of, of the lives of um, enslaved people. And I do think that it's about people being valued usually and and the feedback that I get is, is is around that yeah um next question we have a few more I think we'll have time for them all um so this attendee writes thank you Dr. Skipper focusing on the houses behind the big house is the contrast slash antithesis of the focus on confederate monuments um that I grew up with those monuments asked for slash demanded that my black self celebrate alleged white valor. So how do you think the shift from centering whiteness is creating a white resistance in the form of people arguing um, that blacks are attempting to erase white history and heritage? How do you answer 
the idea that white memorials should remain? That's a good question as well. You know, early on, I, I think that people, I think, would try to trap me by saying, as a historic preservationist, uh, then you should be on board with Confederate memorials and memorialization. And um, and then I would kind of ask him, ask them to think about what's being memorialized and what's being affirmed. And also, of course, more recently, we've understood the context in which those were built. Um, many of, of them, I, I could probably argue all of them to affirm white superiority at times when that was being threatened. So I think that the threat may look different, but in many ways it probably doesn't feel so so different. I guess I'm not going to answer the question fully because what I tend to think about in this conversation is why we don't value these sites as memorials. So I think that what happens, especially in this discussion around Confederate memorials is that the conversation was around taking them down and then building alternatives, which again is, is valid to many people. The conversation that never came up to me is how do we value what we already have, like these slave dwellings? That didn't become the part of the conversation that I think I was most interested in because we have these spaces that are being demolished due to neglect and for a variety of other reasons, but we don't see them as memorials. And this is something that I thought through a little bit about in the book as well. I um, I remember discussions on Facebook uh, and other forms of social media about these plantation houses as memorials to the Confederacy, which I think is a fair argument or case to make. But we don't talk about the Black labor that built them and what that memorializes, or the slave dwellings and what that memorializes. I think that if they got as much attention, then the landscape might seem a bit more balanced to us. It certainly won't be balanced because the problem with a lot of these Confederate memorials is that they are positioned strategically in public places. So they affirm the Confederacy as the public narrative that we should respect in a way that slave dwellings won't. So I'm not arguing that they could do the same kind of work. What I'm saying is that they should be an essential part of this conversation around memorialization. So I, I'm not necessarily critiquing organizations that are trying to get us to memorialize and rethink memorialization. I just hope that we also think about what do we do with what we already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like there's in some ways a very radical gesture when you take an unglamorous dwelling and make that the center of a memorial because you're you're really pushing back our human tendency to want things to be grand and and like really facing the stark contrast and conditions is like a part of that memorialization and so yeah it it's very powerful um okay there's two more questions I'm going to ask them together because they potentially are shorter answers. I'll let you gauge your time. Um, so one of the questions is, does your organization offer financial support to the slave dwelling project as part of your collaboration um, with Joe McGill? The other question is if you have any additional resources for those who want to learn more about slave and share cropper dwellings. So the first, the answer to the first question is no. Our organization does not make money. And because we don't make money, then there's nothing to share. Um, Joseph McGill Jr. Uh, works as uh, part of the in, in interpretive group that we have. So he's essentially hired to do that kind of work, but it's not... Um, I, the, the question to me kind of is, it seems to be asking about some type of donation or philanthropic work. So no, that's not happening. Again, this is, doing this work is a struggle for private homeowners just to maintain these homes. It's, it's um, 
it it's the thing that I think is the hardest message to get around to people that when you have one or two people running such a program with, as I said before, little to no resources, the fact that we do this every year is a miracle in itself. But because it's grassroots, I think there's still a lot that people can learn from that. And I'm not saying that there's a problem with money making that might, you know, I'm sure that that could be um, part of broader conversations at a particular point and then what that means, but that hasn't been the case. That hasn't been the case to date. Can you repeat the second part of that? Yeah, the second question um, is if you have any additional resources for those who want to learn more about slave and sharecropper dwellings. Yes, yeah, so um, my website is certainly one to kind of think about that. Um, Joe McGill's Slave Dwelling Project, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is probably... Joe McGill is probably the biggest advocate for that um, at this point. And most of those are slave dwellings, not necessarily sharecropper dwellings, although we, we do have those in, in Holly Springs. I don't think that's Joe's focus. Or, um, but there are uh, there are some folks that I, I know in the, the Delta who have probably tried to do some more sensitive work around this, although there's there's a lot of um, work that's certainly just tourism oriented and, and what I would consider problematic. But um, I would certainly start start with those two. There haven't been many book text um, written outside of um, you know back of the big house, which is essential to thinking about these things. Another is um actually Joby um Joby Hill's work. Uh Joby Hill actually has a slave dwelling inventory that she worked on for years. I'm not quite sure if she's still I know that she's in a doctoral program now, so I'm not quite sure how much um how much she's uh focusing this is kind of her priority now. She could still be. But she's one of the few people I think whose work is doing that kind of work. So you could probably, I think it's maybe Saving Slave Dwellings, that's that's the site. So that's another person I think um, to look at. I'm, I'm probably gonna have to think more about book texts that kind of deal with this specifically. Right now I'm kind of thinking about individuals that I know who are focusing on this. But whoever asked the question could email me by that time. I might have thought of some different things. For sure. Um, well, that is all our questions and we are at time. Um, so let's give another virtual round of applause to Dr. Skipper. Thank you so much. On behalf of the Herman Grimming Gallier Historic Houses, I'd like to thank Dr. Skipper for speaking with us this evening. Um, for any of you who are still logged on for more information on upcoming lectures in the Gallier Gathering series, um, most of which, um, a little bit more than half of which we do them monthly, uh, are virtual um, if you're not in town, um, including our January 10th virtual lecture by Fatima Shaikh, who will speak on her book on the Economy Hall Brotherhood and Mutual Aid Society of New Orleans. Um, you can find out more at our website, hggh.org or on our social media. And once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Skipper and thank you audience um, for your continued support of our museum. We look forward to seeing you at our next Gallier gathering. Thanks, Amy, and thanks everybody for listening. All right. Bye-bye.